Grace, mercy, and peace to all of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The lesson for our meditation this morning is the gospel lesson read a moment ago from Mark 14 and 15. And our sermon theme today is entitled, I've Fallen and I Can't Get Up. Dear friends and beloved brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. So one of the following sayings doesn't belong with the other. No pain, no gain. Sweat plus sacrifice equals success. We shall overcome. This too will pass. Or, I've fallen and I can't get up. All but one of those sayings portrays perseverance, desire, steadfastness, hope. But one of them portrays hopelessness, helplessness, submission, defeat. I've fallen and I can't get up. When the world will talk about Christianity, some of the more well-known even evangelists of our day will try to define Christianity as a means of self-help, personal victory over life's trials. And Jesus becomes a template to follow for sticking to it, to overcome hardships and to achieve success in life. But then... You have the Jesus of the gospel lesson today from Mark 14 and 15. The text today is not one that will be used by motivational speakers. This is because the text is more suited to discuss another less popular aspect of the Christian faith, which is Christian suffering. Nobody enjoys suffering, whether you're a Christian or not. Understandably, we try to avoid suffering by any way we can. And even Jesus wasn't thrilled about the prospect of suffering himself. You heard the night before his crucifixion, he knew exactly what was waiting on him the next day. And he was exceedingly upset. He prayed so hard under such duress that he was literally sweating blood. He prayed to the Father to do it any other way if there was some other way possible. Trials are not enjoyable. Trials and suffering are byproducts of sin. All of us are sinful by nature. And in our sufferings, we tend to show our fallen nature. When a trial hits, the first thing we have a tendency to do is to complain. We start in with the why me questions. Thousands of other moms could have come down with cancer. Lord, why did mine have to? Why am I going through this pain? What did I do to deserve this? We're never able to see the potential spiritual benefit of suffering. We just focus on the problem and how badly we want out of it. So we complain during trials, and when we do, our faith has fallen, and it might have difficulty getting back up. And after our complaining, then we start to blame. We blame others. We blame God. We blame everybody but ourselves. I'm so sick of my boss at work, God. She never seems to get off my back. She's the cause of all of my problems. You know, if my doctor had half a brain, he would have seen this coming, and my husband's situation wouldn't be nearly as bad as it is. God, why can't you stop these problems that keep coming to me? You're supposed to be taking care of me. This is your fault, God. We blame our suffering on the perceived incompetence of other people and on the perceived shortcomings of God. We blame in times of trial, and as we do, our faith is fallen, and it might have difficulty getting back up. Then, after the complaining and the blaming, we avoid. 
Many will say that we live in a time where we can worship freely. Suffering on account of our Christian faith isn't a big problem here in America like it was in biblical times, it seems. But here's a tough question. Has society adopted or adapted to Christianity or have Christians adapted to our society? Could it be that the reason we rarely suffer for our faith the way a lot of people do around the world is because we avoid topics of controversy in our faith to remain popular and accepted? Do we sometimes avoid a strong, clear confession of Scripture to other people because we don't want to offend anyone or make anybody uncomfortable? I'm afraid that we often think about the potential pain of standing up for God's word and we decide to avoid it. And as we do, our faith has fallen and it might have difficulty getting back up. And in addition to the complaining, the blaming, and the avoiding in times of trial, sometimes we also cause our own trials or the trials of others. How many times have you had a bad day at work and you take it out on the ones whom you love the most? Maybe you've had an unexpected expense to deal with, but you respond by withholding God's offerings on a weekend. We feel that if we must suffer, it's only fair that other people ought to suffer too. So we can cause times of trials with our poor decisions, and as we do, our faith has fallen and it might have difficulty getting back up. We fail to see that with every complaint, every statement of blame, every act of avoidance of conflict due to Jesus, every act of instigation, our spiritual feet fall out from underneath us. We spiritually drop down to our knees not because the things that we are suffering are too much to handle, but because of our resulting attitude has weakened our spiritual foundation. I've fallen and I can't get up. In times of suffering under the weight of sin, we've fallen and know we're not able to get up on our own. And that can be a good thing because that humbles us. But God's word to you is that in those times of humbling, we can see the one person who remains standing, and that is Jesus. And we know that due to Jesus' suffering, we who have fallen do in fact get up in Christ. As it says in Isaiah 53, Jesus is the one person who has endured all suffering and faced every kind of pain yet stands firm. And you are baptized into him. Jesus knows. He understands our weaknesses. He understands our shortcomings. He knows what it's like to bear the weight of sin. He clearly understands sufferings and trials. But the sinless Jesus doesn't react to suffering the same way that we do. And because Jesus knows what it's like to suffer, our faith stands firm in him. In Jesus' suffering, unlike us, he never complained. He never asked the Father, why me? He never decried the injustice of his trial. He never demanded an explanation as to why he had to suffer. Instead, in the face of trials, Jesus simply said, Father, thy will and not my will be done. We complain during trials, but Jesus did not. And since our faith is founded on Jesus, he sees to it that our faith doesn't fall, but it stands firm. In Jesus' suffering, unlike us, he never passed blame. He didn't cry out from the cross that the ones who crucified him were the ones to blame for his unfair suffering. He never blamed the Father for his difficult position. Instead, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. 
We pass blame during trials, but Jesus did not. And since our faith is founded on Jesus, he sees to it that our faith doesn't fall, but it stands firm. In Jesus' suffering, unlike us, he doesn't avoid. While he was crucified, many were calling for him to come down from the cross to prove that he was the Son of God. He was probably tempted to come down to avoid all of that pain and suffering that he was dealing with. And he absolutely had the power to come off the cross any time he wanted. But instead of avoiding the suffering like we do, he chose to hang there and finish the job until we heard him say, it is finished. We tried to avoid suffering during times of trial, but Jesus did not. And since our faith is founded on Jesus, he sees to it that our faith doesn't fall, but it stands firm. And unlike us, Jesus did not cause additional suffering with poor choices. He silently took every crack of the whip that knocked him to the ground, every scratch in his scalp from the crown of thorns, every piercing nail that made him slump lifeless on the cross, and he didn't respond in a way that would have caused additional suffering to others. And because of Jesus' sinless suffering, he sees to it that our faith doesn't fall, but it stands firm. So we see that what St. Paul wrote in Romans 8 is actually true. He said, the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is revealed to us in Christ Jesus. That, my friends, is what sets Christians apart. Unlike the world in times of suffering, we have hope. We know that our suffering isn't some random act of bad luck, but it's used by God to somehow build us up. And when we respond to suffering with a positive attitude, people are going to take notice. You can actually be an inspiration of other people who are suffering but do not have hope. Because they're going to want to know the reason for your joy in your time of trial. And God can use that for you to give witness to them about Jesus. Your experiences in life can help people through their times of suffering. And your unwavering faith in Jesus can be proclaimed to them so they too would come to know and love Jesus. And they too would cling to Jesus in times of trial. In Christ your faith will not fall. But he is your strength and he will use you in times of trial to further his kingdom. So... We can actually approach problems with confidence, knowing that Christ did not remain slumped on the cross, because on the third day he stood up. He has overcome all suffering and all problems, and because Jesus dwells within us, we will overcome them too. Jesus' resurrection enables us to stand up in the face of suffering. We can stand firm against those who mock or belittle us because of our faith. We can stand firm against any trial that the world will throw out at you because by nature we may have fallen and never would have gotten up. But in Christ, we can stand with confidence that we will stand with Jesus on the last day. Thanks be to God. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until his second coming. Amen. We rise for the prayers of the church.